Hey everyone, Dan Johnson here. I'm the Jack of All Ministries, here to help you make it happen. And today I'm going to show you my most recent project, which is finishing some really cool modern barn doors in our upstairs bathroom. So this project that I just finished up is one that we knew that we were going to do when we bought the house. See, the, the attic space up there is what we used as our master bedroom, and it presented a lot of challenges when we bought the house. Ultimately, I kind of, you know, put my amateur architecture skills, you know, to the test and came up with a design for something that made sense as a bathroom, trying to deal with um, kind of the trusses that were exposed above our head, as well as the, you know, sloped roof, which really limits your headroom. And so we put the closet up against kind of this whole, you know, part of the lower sloped end of the roof and we decided that we were going to have some barn doors to get in there and so the contractors framed all that up for us and then I came through later and finished with the drywall and then put the trim around the opening but it's really just been sitting there for the last year and a half or so. So when my wife came up to me and asked me to finish up those barn doors for her birthday I thought that it would be a great opportunity to do something nice for her and to get a project done. So I kind of decided I didn't want to spend any more than $500 on this project. If you really wanted to, you could get the cost down to closer to $200 if you use just kind of a, a standard, you know, the black, you know, barn looking um, barn door hardware. Uh, you can get that a lot cheaper than what we did. Uh, you could use different handles. You could just use cheaper plywood all the way around. But, you know, we wanted to put a little bit more into it. We didn't go all out, but we wanted to go... A little bit more quality and have, uh, you know, the, the oak and the maple and we wanted to have nicer handles and stuff like that. So we decided to make 500 kind of our limits uh, and we came in underneath that and that worked out pretty well. Um, what we did was we went on Amazon and we got this stainless steel barn door kit for the hardware because we didn't want to go with that, you know, traditional black, you know, kind of rustic looking feel. We wanted to be a little bit more modern than that. Uh, we really couldn't find anything brass, but we like the stainless steel. My wife says it's okay to mix metals. We do have some other metals up in our bathroom too, so it, it goes fine. Um, she's really happy with it in the end. So we went with the stainless steel. Uh, that was about $170 for the 10-foot double door rail. We bought some handles on Amazon as well, some like really wide drawer pulls that we were going to use, um, and those were $88. But then we decided to change our minds, or my wife did rather, uh, when we were out in Chicago checking out rejuvenation and she found these appliance handles um, that were a little bit more than a hundred bucks for the two of them. Uh, we got a pretty good deal on them actually. Um, so we decided to use those instead, but honestly, uh, if you didn't use those, you could really cut down the cost by doing that. For the wood cost, we bought uh, we used a quarter inch oak plywood, not the stuff that has MDF in the middle, but the stuff that's actually ply, um, and that was about forty five dollars. Uh, then I got three sheets of four by eight maple plywood, quarter inch, you know, same deal, not the MDF core, but the actual ply core. Um, those are thirty dollars a piece, so I spent about ninety bucks on that. I got a piece of aspen, and I'll explain you know, as we go a little bit more why I use that, but that kind of was for the edge of the door to make it feel like it was one species. I know maple and aspen are not the same, but uh, aspen was a pretty cheap wood that looked similar enough, and you'll see that it ends up working out great in the end. Uh, that was $13 for one uh, one by four board, eight feet long. And then I bought an oak board as well. Uh, now it was also one by four, also eight feet long. Uh, to do the same thing on the oak section of the door, and that was about 20 bucks. And then, you know, I also had a sheet of MDF lying around, but I mean, you know, it's like $29 at Lowe's right now to get a half-inch sheet, uh, which is what I used. And then if you factor in another $30 or so for stain and sandpaper and poly and stuff like that, uh, you know, you end up, you know, in that $500 range. So that was what we ended up using for materials, and in the end, it was really um, totally worth it, in my opinion. I think the doors are beautiful. So now that we had had this opening in our bedroom to the closet for a year and a half and we were finally going to do something different, I gave my wife an assignment. I went ahead and started by installing the hardware, but I said, hey, why don't you take a look at some inspirations on, you know, Pinterest or in her magazines or whatever it is that she's looking at. And I said, you know, give me an idea of what you want a door to look like. And so she found this example and she said, this is what I want the doors to look like. And in looking at that, I thought, okay, those are going to be some pretty expensive doors, but let me see what I can do to kind kind of, you know, change things up a little bit to make it something that's a little bit more affordable, something that I can build. Uh, and in the end, I think I got, you know, fairly close to it. It's, it's not exactly like the original, but I think the elements that made her love it are the things that I was able to capture. And so I'm really happy with the way that things came out in the end. 
And so while she was, you know, kind of looking at that stuff, I went ahead and installed the hardware. Uh, you start off with these little brackets, and they're very simple to install. You, you kind of have to space them out uh, based on the rail itself. And then when you install them, it's very simple because you could just use one screw, which is nice because if the holes don't perfectly line up, you know, it's easy to back out one screw and kind of rotate it a little bit. So that went up really easily. Uh, but I wanted to just do the left side first so that I can kind of manipulate the right side if I had to. Marking everything off in a straight line uh, would be a super bummer if at the end of it you get all the way to the last one and it's off because you tried to do everything ahead of time. So I went ahead and just installed the left side first. I put the railing up onto the brackets and just kind of loosely tightened it with the Allen screws there, just enough to keep it tight so that I could then get the right side matched up um, because the railing is actually two different pieces and there's kind of a piece that goes in the middle to join them together. And then once I got the right side, kind of the brackets up there and the rails attached and the, the center joining piece up there, um, I knew that I was ready to go ahead and move on to the next step. And at that point, I went ahead and I tightened everything down with the Allen wrench, made sure it's nice and snug against the wall. Uh, I put on the end caps so that the, you know, the railing isn't just an open pipe. It's actually has an end cap on it. And then they have these little bumper stops that you use to kind of keep the wheels from falling off the end of the track. And I went ahead and just popped those up there temporarily because I knew I would adjust them once I had the doors finished. So at that point, I was ready to start building the doors. Now, this was a big challenge for me because, first of all, I made it way too complicated from the get-go. Uh, by the time I got working on the second door, I had the formula figured out, and you'll see that as we go. But the other thing that was a challenge is I did this kind of in the dead of winter. I started in like the second week of January here in Illinois, and my workshop is not very big at all. And so I'm building two doors that are, you know, 80 and a half inches tall, and what ended up being 31 and a half inches wide but still dealing with four by eight sheets of plywood and stuff in my tiny little shop. And so that was a big challenge and it was very frustrating. And that actually had a very big impact on the way I made these doors. Had I waited to do this in the springtime, it would have been a lot easier because I'd be able to be moving things outside and stuff like that while I was working. But I didn't have that. Wanted to get it done closer to my wife's birthday, which was at the end of January. I didn't get it finished on, on time, by the way. But I wanted to get the process going, and it just was a little bit of a challenge there. So you're going to see that this whole process was not very seamless from the get-go. So one of the things I ran into is what I wanted to do is I wanted to cut 45s out of the end pieces. So the way this door is essentially going to work is I'm going to have sheets of plywood on the inside and outside portions of the door, and then the sides we're going to have kind of a veneer near, if you will. I took those boards that I bought, the oak and the aspen, and I cut just the edges out so that I could put that, so that would be visible on the door, but the inside framing and stuff of the door was obviously not going to be made out of oak and aspen. I made it out of MDF. So really, only the outside portions of the door frame were actually made from really, you know, nice quality hardwoods. And so when I did this, I wanted to cut the plywood at a 45 and also cut those end pieces at a 45, so that at the corner there would be no seam, really, where you wouldn't be able to tell that I was using plywood for the outside edges. So I wanted to cut those 45s, but that was really difficult with wavy quarter inch pieces of plywood in a tiny shop where nobody could get there to hold it flat up against the fence when I was cutting it on my table saw. And so the, the weird edges and stuff like that ended up making the very long cuts on this plywood just wavy, not perfect. And so from the get-go, I knew that that wasn't going to work. I also wanted to get the angled piece because I have the upper portion is made out of maple, the lower portion is made out of oak. And I wanted to be able to cut those two things into a straight line while you by using the table saw. I kind of cut out a portion of the maple and inserted the oak into it so that I could cut it as if it was one sheet, but that was way overdoing it. That was totally unnecessary. Um, I ended up just putting both pieces on top of the frame and then routing it with a flush bit, which made so much more sense. But my first go, I tried to you know glue up the seam and then run it through the table saw. And when I did that, it just completely fell apart. What I decided to do was just put the you know put it on top of the other piece and then bevel it. Uh, with a router. And when I did that, the router bit actually came out on me and slid up and then cut a huge 45, um, like wavy 45, way more out of the wood than I wanted there to be. Uh, so later on, I was going to have to actually narrow out the doors because originally they were going to be about 32 inches. I ended up cutting them down to 31 and a half um, so that I could cut that bevel out and then redo it. 
Then things got worse because I was filming with my, you know, Osmo uh, DJI Pocket 2 camera, which I use for all my, you know, B-roll outdoors stuff because, you know, it's a small camera. It's easy to move around, stays out of the way. Um, I don't mind if it gets dirty. Uh, and I knocked the stupid thing over and I broke the autofocus on it. The focal part inside the lens won't move anymore. And so it's locked into a certain focus at all times. I always use just the little screen, so I wasn't able to tell how blurry the shots actually were. And I was doing three different projects at the same time. So when I was finally done and looked at the footage, I realized nothing was in focus. And so for my next couple of videos, there's going to be some blurry shots when I'm working in my shop and stuff like that. And I apologize that I'm stupid and knocked it over and didn't pay attention. So basically what I'm trying to say is this did not start out very good. Okay, so one of the big initial challenges with this door is figuring out how I'm going to use an angled piece of wood up against a, an obviously cut out portion of the upper side of the door. And the reason why that's a challenge is because I wanted the grain to go different directions. I thought that that was kind of one of the cool features about the door. Now you might think, okay, well then just use a four by eight sheet, put it up there and you know make a door that's four feet wide. But you got to remember the Pythagorean theorem, people. The hypotenuse of a triangle is always going to be longer than the sides of a right triangle. Angle, and that's basically what you're working with on a door. And so that hypotenuse was going to be bigger than, you know, the actual sides. And since I'm rotating it, it's creating a hypotenuse on the door. And so basically I had to figure out how much room did I have to work with? Because if I slide that piece of wood up against the other one, you're going to start creating a hole on the bottom of that side. And so that was going to be an issue for me. So I wanted to make sure that I could come out with a shape that was going to fit where I could use one piece of wood without having to join it, you know, together or something like that. Um, and so I didn't want the doors to be too wide. 31 and a half ended up being great because then I could really have a line that could go across both doors, take up a significant amount of space, and not be too flat. Basically, rather than doing the math, I ended up just taking, you know, a piece of the plywood, holding it up there, moving it around until I liked where it landed, and then I just marked it off with a pencil and I cut it. So once I had the top portions kind of cut out, I knew that I'd be able to work with it, and I had given up on my original plan of trying to make everything fit and running it through a table saw. I decided I was going to go ahead and take the bottom piece that I had already cut to the right size, build the frame around that, and then make the top pieces fit later, and then trim it all with the router. That was by far the easier way to go. So once I had the back of the door already ready to go, one rectangular sheet, the right size, I went ahead and took the pieces that I had cut out for the top and I just traced off the angle so I knew exactly where it was gonna end up. So once I knew where the angle was gonna be across the door, I took those veneered sides like I was telling you about, the, the piece of aspen and the piece of oak, and I put it so that it lined it up exactly where the seam was going to end up. And so I went ahead and glued those down into place. Uh, and then I built a frame on the inside of those two pieces of the veneer wood, if you will. What I ended up doing was taking a half inch sheet of MDF and just cutting a bunch of um, kind of planks out of it so that I could use it as like framing board. But the problem was the, the aspen and the oak were actually three quarters of an inch. So I used the half inch and I ended up shimming it up uh, with a scrap piece of like Luan that I had lying around around, which brought it pretty close to even. And the differences wasn't something that I was really worried about because once I clamp it down, it's going to be, it was so close, you would never see a flex in the wood or anything like that. So I went ahead and I made the MDF frame by cutting out those panels. And then I lined the inside where up against where those, you know, veneered pieces were. I ran a support across the seam. I also ran a support across the top, but for that I used real wood because I wanted to be able to screw the hardware into wood and not into MDF. And then I also took a three inch, a three quarter inch board and then I used that to be kind of a support where the handle was gonna end up going. It would have ended up being fine. I wasn't thinking ahead. I was thinking about using wood screws for the handle, which was dumb because um, those handles have to be screwed all the way through the door and then the screw goes in the backside. So I could have just used MDF, but I used three quarter inch board anyway, and it worked out fine. Now for the bottom of the door, there's needed to be a little bit of a track there because what happens is when these doors are actually hung up on the rail, they naturally want to swing forward and back anywhere they want to go. If you're just swinging these doors open and closed, they're just going to run into the wall, um, which is obviously not what you want to do. So there's a little bit of a guide at the bottom, which goes up into the door. So there needed to be a slot. And I thought about just, you know, 
kind of putting wood in there and then just like routing out a groove. Uh, but I decided it would be smarter just to, you know, sandwich two pieces of the plywood that I was using, glue that up and then do that on the front and the back um, and then leave the caps, you know, solid. That way the guide could slide back and forth in there. And that worked out really well. Um, it's plenty strong. It's not going anywhere and it holds the doors plenty of straight when things are done. So once I had those parts of the frame in there, I also put a couple of supports across the middle uh, just to make sure that I had some strength to hold the door as one piece, had that all glued up and it was ready to go. And then it was time to transfer over to the top portion of the door or really the front face of the door. After I had the bottom and the frame all glued up and ready to go, I went ahead and I brought in my two top pieces. Uh, I installed the maple at the top first, according to the angles that had already been determined by where those veneer boards ended up. I uh, went ahead and glued that down, and then I got my piece of oak at the bottom and pushed that flush against the maple uh, and glued that down as well, so I had a solid door at this point that I was very happy with. Now, before I got to the second door, I wanted to test things out, and so I was going to go ahead and just route the edges off to make it smooth and just make sure that there wasn't anything I wasn't thinking of. And so I used a flush bit and I cleaned up the edges and then I got a 45 degree bit that I was going to use to bevel the wood. And that's when I ran into an issue. Apparently the last time I used my router, I just took that 45 degree bit and just stuck it in there and never actually tightened it down. So you can probably see where I'm going with this. I assumed that it was tight like it normally is, and I turned it on and went across, and everything seemed fine. And then all of a sudden, I noticed that the bevel started going in and waving, and it looked horrible. It cut in, you know, about a quarter of an inch into the wood with waves, and it just looked terrible. And I couldn't figure out what happened, and I turned around and looked at the router, and the bit is hanging halfway out. And then it clicked. I never checked to see if it was tightened, and obviously after the last time I used it, I didn't tighten it, and I just stuck it back in the router. So I was really frustrated with myself, and I went ahead and quit for a while and went to think about what I was going to do. Ultimately, when I came back, I decided I was going to go ahead and shave off a half inch and then redo it. It wasn't a big deal, and uh, there was plenty of space left on the doors, so I shrunk it down from 32 to, 32 to 31 and a half. Uh, crisis averted, and it worked out okay. Both doors came out lining up almost perfectly. It's, it's beautiful. I'm very happy with the way both doors came out structurally and functionally, uh, and I think they look great too. Once everything was glued up and I was done swinging things around in my shop, of course the weather got better. So I was able to work outside a little bit because for about a week or so I had actually really good weather. It was up in the 50s and 60s and even up into about 70 degrees. And so I laid out the doors, I went around everything with the flush bit and just made sure everything lined up, including the bottom. Because at the bottom I had four different layers of plywood essentially. And so I made sure everything lined up with that bottom piece because the bottom of the door was what basically worked everything for me. Now, when I say bottom, I really mean the back, but when I'm laying the door down on its back, that becomes the bottom layer. So once I had everything flushed up, I went around and kind of gave everything just a brief sand to make sure that any wood glue was, was flattened out and stuff like that. Kind of looked at the top to see if I had dripped anything anywhere. I wanted to be really careful about this though, because you don't want to burn through the top layer of the veneer of the plywood um, and end up really, you know, revealing some junk wood underneath. Um, so I was very careful about sanding that down to make sure everything was nice and ready to go for the next step. So to start making things look pretty, I got my painter's tape and I, I ran that right where the seam between the oak and the maple was because I didn't want there, there to be this big hole there. And so I put the tape across there as close to the edge as I could and I filled that gap with stainable wood filler, the kind that has wood fibers in it, um, because I really wanted that to fill out. And so once I got that filled out, I took the tape off and it was just a very fine, uh, you know, maybe an eighth of an inch wide uh, worth of filler going across in a straight line. The next thing I did was I got out my four foot level and I clamped it down so that I had a straight line to follow to make sure that I could make that seam be perfectly straight with my router. And I got a V groove bit, which I used to cut a little bit of a V shaped groove across that seam so that it would come together really nicely and the inside would be filled with wood filler that would be stainable. And to make things match, I also on the back side of the door did kind of a faux line because on the front you have the oak that comes up against the maple, but on the back it's all maple. But I still routed that same groove in there so that it kind of felt cohesive. This That's on the inside of the closet anyway, so you don't really need to see the two different species of wood. And really the stain kind of distinguishes between the two sections anyway. But having that, that line just, you know, routed in there with a V groove, I think looks really nice and kind of completes the door. And if you're not paying attention, 
and you really won't notice that the two different species aren't there. However, on the front, I'm glad I did the difference between the oak and the maple because the grain direction changes and the type of wood changes, and I just think that that looks beautiful. But on the inside of the closet, nobody's really looking at that anyway. So then to draw everything together, I used my 45 degree bit, which was actually tightened down this time, and went around all the edges of the door to make sure that I had a bevel on all four edges on the front and the back. Now, because this was plywood, there were slight little holes and things like that. So I went around with that same stainable wood filler and just kind of lightly filled in the holes and made sure everything was kind of seamless and smooth. Um, I was being very careful not to get too much of that stuff onto the plywood because like I said, I don't want to have to, uh, I don't want to accidentally sand through it later. Before I got to staining, my wife had a really good idea. She had me route in another V-groove about eight inches in from the top of the door to the seam to give it kind of just a styling line, and I thought that that came out really great. So after that, I went over to the Ace Hardware where my son works, uh, and I got some Varathane stain, which I brought a couple different cans home so that I could test it and show my wife and see what she thought. So I made up these you know, five different sample pieces uh, of both species of wood, covered each one with each version of stain that I had, uh, and then left kind of a control sample, if you will, and showed my wife and asked her what she thought and had to pick out. So if you look at these samples yourselves, which ones do you think would have been nice to use one on the bottom and one on the top? Well, for the oak, we ended up using the Kona, and we ended up using the Early American for the maple, and I thought that that was a great choice. I'm really happy with the way it came out, especially the Kona on the oak. There's, It's, it's a really dark stain, and where all the grain is and stuff, it, it really, really goes deep. But there's a lot of these really, you know, lighter, almost reddish brown tones that kind of pop through as well. And it just looks so rich. And I just love the way the oak came out. And I feel like there's kind of a sleekness to the way that the early American came out on the maple as well. So I'm really happy with uh, the colors that we chose. So then I went ahead and put on the finish coats. I used one of my favorite finishes, and it's just wipe on poly. It's basically just polyurethane mixed with mineral spirits, and you can wipe it right on with a rag. Uh, we used a satin finish, and I put three coats on there, and in the end, I feel like it's very protected. Uh, it's a durable finish, and it looks really great. Uh, and then I had just a couple of finishing things to do before I was ready to finally take it up uh, to the closet in my bedroom. So for the rolling hardware, I had to pre-drill a couple of holes, and then I installed some insert nuts, uh, which would really lock it into place. And I didn't want to over-torque it, so after I put them in, I tightened it down with my impact that I just used, you know, a hex bit to get the, the Allen screws down to where they were almost touching. But then I finished it off with the Allen wrench because I didn't want to over-torque and, you know, pull that stuff out of the wood or anything like that. And then it was time to take the doors upstairs and put them on the barn door hardware for the closet. So when I first got them in, I set the rollers onto the rail to see how it was going to look, and I was already thrilled with it. Uh, but I didn't put the, the locks on there that keep it from falling off the rail because I was going to need to remove them after I finished installing the guides. But before I put in the guides, I wanted to install the handles because at that point I was just excited to finally see them up and I wanted to see what the handles looked like. And so I put some painter's tape over the holes where they were going to be, uh, you know, drilled a hole, got the handle started at the bottom and then turned it up to kind of mark off where the other hole was going to be, uh, drilled the other hole, you know, protecting, you know, blowing out through the wood or whatever with the painter's tape. Um, then installed the handles, got them tightened down, and at that point my wife was already thrilled with the way the doors looked, so I just had to put on the finishing touches at that point. Of course, one of those things is the guides that I mentioned earlier. Uh, these basically need to ride into a quarter inch slot on the bottom of the doors, which is why I use those extra sheets of plywood to create that groove so that the guide could just slide back and forth in there. Uh, I kind of moved the doors back and forth to find out where the good point was going to be because the guides sit in that groove and at a certain point when your door is all the way open, it's going to hit that guide and it's not going to open anymore. And then when you shut it, you also run the risk of hitting the guide and you want to make sure the door is closed. Um, nothing would be a bigger disappointment than trying to shut the door and having a two inch gap because your guides are too far out. Uh, so I got all that figured out, measured up, installed the guides, just drilled them right into the floor. Uh, you know, up there we have like a wooden subfloor up there, so I could just go right into that with no problem. And then I was able to put in the little locks that keep the, the wheels on the railing, uh, on the rails, the wheels on the hardware from falling off the rails. Why is that so hard to say? It's not. I'm stupid.
And finally, after that, those end stops that I had installed, you know, when I put in the hardware in the first place, I found the right position for those to keep the hardware from flying off the end of the rail and, you know, splintering through the door. And I'll end up with, you know, doors hanging off the rails and stuff like that. Uh, so everything was then tuned up, locked into place, finished, and it was all ready to go. And this is what the finished product looks like. I was really, really happy that next morning when I walked into the bathroom the first time, looked over and saw that our closet doors were covered up by these beautiful new doors. They don't look exactly like the inspiration piece, but honestly, my wife loves them. I love them. They're, they're lightweight, um, but they look like they weigh a thousand pounds. We like it so much better than, you know, like a typical rustic type barn door. Um, it just matches who we are better. And in the end, I couldn't be more happy with the way that things turned out. And so that's going to do it for this video, guys. I hope that you enjoyed the process of me building this door, and I hope that it inspires you a little bit to think of ideas that you might have in putting barn doors in your own house. If you found it helpful, I'd appreciate it if you consider liking this video and subscribing to my channel because this is the sort of thing that I love to tackle. And with that, I hope you have a great day, and I will see you on the next video.